Hello and welcome to another episode of the iPhotography podcast. Uh, you're listening to Stephen or you're watching Stephen if you're catching this also on YouTube. Um, I'm one of the iPhotography tutors here and today we're going to be joined by iPhotography's 2020 Photographer of the Year, Deborah McPhail. Uh, Deborah is a highly accomplished landscape photographer. And I thought it'd be fantastic for her to be able to come on and just maybe give a little bit of a background um, to kind of her life as a photographer so far, what she's been up to over the past 12 months and also what she's looking forward to uh, to doing. So uh, we're going to kind of cut from this moment here and then we're going to go straight into the interview itself. If you want to check out a little bit more of Deborah's work, you can do. There'll be links in the description to this podcast and this video so you can check out the rest of her website and her Instagram handle if you wanted to as well. I hope you enjoy the interview. Let's get started. So yeah, so Deborah, I want to kind of kick off with a, a couple of questions just to get a little bit of, um, I suppose, a bit of a backstory really as to kind of how you got to be the photographer that you are today. But what what's your kind of photography journey been like up until now? Um, I think probably it all started with my dad, really. He was a keen photographer and he always had a, photo, you know, a camera around his neck taking pictures of us when we were on holidays and that kind of thing. But he was always more into portraits um, and it was never anything that I was ever interested in because I always saw him messing around with settings and going <laughs> manual and I thought that's just not for me, that's too hard, it's too complicated. So when I got a bit older and I started to do traveling myself, you know, going on holidays and things like that, I just had a little point and shoot camera. So it was a little uh, compact Canon camera that I had back in the day. This was prior to digital, so it was film. Um, and I used to really love just taking pictures, but more snapshots, I think. And it was more sort of documenting the places that I'd been. So my house really is filled with albums with all these printed out for various holidays and, and things like that. So it was more like a diary, I think, that I, I started to, um, you know, develop. And then as I started doing more and more of that, I thought, I'm sure I could make these photographs better because they were, well, you, you might know yourself from taking film, you know, you'd have a 36 exposure, you would go to the chemist, get them developed yeah. you'd maybe have five out of that spool that were worth <laughs> keeping and the rest you just threw away and I thought surely I could take better ones than this so that's when I started to get more interested in um, photography I guess and I yeah. bought my first digital camera and that's when I think it started to get better um, I did a, a one-day workshop just locally where they were sort of teaching you the basics of camera settings and all that kind of thing so along with like my dad and my, my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, he was into photography as well. So they kind of gave me the basics um, and it's just been developing that, you know, over the last few years, I think I've got more into it over maybe the last five years, I would say a bit more serious. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's just been a constant development, I think, from taking those snapshots years ago to, you know, getting something a bit better yeah. nowadays. It, it's lovely that you are surrounded with people, say, like from your dad and your husband, that are both quite artistically minded in that way that they, you know, yep. do you feel that has kind of like motivated you a little bit or, you know, just kind of give you a bit of a nudge to, to continue? I, I think it has. It's maybe there's a bit of a competitive nature in there as well, because <laughs> I want to try and get something a wee bit better, you know, than maybe what my dad had or maybe what my husband <laughs> Yeah, I hope he's not going to be listening to this. <laughs> I hope he is. <laughs> um, <laughs> Got to keep so that competitiveness. It, yeah, well, that's it. You know, when you think, okay, well, what are you, what are you settings are you using for this? What can I do? And we kind of bounce off one another, I think, because quite often he'll ask, what are you doing? And how did you manage to get that photograph? And, you know, we sort of um, share bits of tidbits and things like that. Because when we, both, we go on holiday, we both of us have our cameras out. And it's um, both of us sitting, you know, on a hillside waiting for the sunrise or the sunset or something. So well, that's uh, lovely that you've got someone so patient, because I know many, many photographers may have other halves, you know, partners that, that maybe aren't as understanding. Yeah. But to actually have someone that's, you know, a good support network for you, that it is probably kind of quite, um, quite, yeah, I would imagine it'd be quite motivating, really. I can understand that. Now, you were saying before that you, um, you had like an old Canon point and shoot when you kind of first yeah. started out. and. I suppose as eye photography, we never really kind of 
um, you know, push push the kind of the aspect that having all the best gear makes the best photographer. And I know you'll understand that yourself, yeah. but sometimes there is an interest for people to know, um, you know, what type of kit that some really kind of aspiring and some strong photographers have got. Um, just to kind of maybe give them a little bit of a, an idea of what they could possibly look at, you know, or really kind of what good quality cameras and good quality lenses um, can help create. But what what kind of items do you have in your kit bag? What what kind of uh, camera are you running it, at the minute? It's Canon again, mainly because my dad was always Canon. Um, he didn't never used anything else, so I inherited quite a few of his lenses, which kind of helped sort of give me the the kickstart, I guess, to to stick with Canon. Because once you've got the glass, it's quite expensive. Well, as everyone will know, to mm. to rebuy everything again. Um, so I've got the five D Mark IV at the moment, um, and I tend to use a wide angle lens for the landscape um, shots. I tend to like the big epic vistas. Oh, yeah. um, so it's the sort of, I think it's 16 to 35 millimeter um, lens I tend to use the most. That, that should, do that. you have any others or is that like you, you're pretty much your main one? To be honest, I've got quite lazy. I do have other ones, but as soon as I bought the wide angle, that seems to be the one that I keep on the camera most of yeah. the time. Yeah. Um, if I yeah. do, yeah, if I do wildlife photography, which I'm doing a little bit more of now, simply because I can't get out and do landscape photography, <laughs> yeah. I've tend to be spending most of my weekends in the back garden now. Mm -hmm. um, I've got the, the 100 to 400 Canon mm -hmm. again, which is it's a pretty good lens. Um, oh, indeed. Yeah, absolutely. Crack it. Yeah. And just, as you say, just the kind of thing that you need for uh, for wildlife, really, to be able to keep that distance, but also then to, to move in and out a kind of quick, um, a quick short, uh, short notice, really. Um, yeah. but that's, that's brilliant, because I say a lot of people will, they'll not necessarily know where to start in terms of buying kit or, you know, what lenses they, they need. But I should say, I think because, like you said, you've progressed a lot over time, you've tried lots of different areas, you've started to find yourself a, a bit of a niche, a bit of a comfort zone, mm. and therefore bought the appropriate kit for it but um but just for those people that are, are listening and are not kind of fully aware of your background Deborah I probably should have said at the start that at the end of 2020 that you were you were voted by members of I photography um as our overall student of the year so that was like our kind of prestigious landmark event um <laughs> it, it's it's wonderful I mean obviously I've never been on the end of it myself and I know you know only a few people have over the years since we started but um how how did that kind of feel to actually kind of get that announcement really and be kind of uh, put on that kind of pedestal to be honest I couldn't believe it <laughs> as soon as I found out I was straight on the phone to my husband at work saying you're never going to believe it <laughs> I don't think he could believe it either, to be honest, but <laughs> I, I just thought it, it was so nice given that you see the standard of photographs in the gallery and they are amazing. Um, and to think that last year, I think, was a challenge for all of us, especially mm. for me, I like landscapes. So not being able to go out as much as I would like to um, and then still have the photographs that I did manage to take being judged as good enough yeah. was amazing for me so i'd just like to thank everybody that voted for me really it's really appreciated oh and there were and there were lots there were really really and we had a large amount of people that were voting but as i say it was it was a tough competition because because there were some fantastic images in there but you you kind of really stood out because i think you also had images um submitted for the the landscape category as well didn't yeah. you as i remember yeah because i mean yeah. again from you know obviously what we've seen of you in the eye photography gallery you know landscape photography seems to be your your bread and butter but i mean mm. you've mentioned briefly a little bit about trying uh wildlife photography at the moment but is there any other areas in particular that you kind of really enjoy or is it primarily landscapes it's primarily landscapes. Um, I think I've gone over to the wildlife side of things more recently because it's kind of the same as landscape photography in that you're trying to capture a moment. Mm -hmm. You know, with landscapes, you're trying to get the moment the sunrise or the sunset or something. But with wildlife, you're trying to capture that moment where the animal's doing or the bird is doing what you want it to do. <laughs> so it's not just a case of turning up and taking a photograph and actually done, you, you know, it does take patience. And um, I, I find that quite nice, especially in current circumstances, just for mindfulness, if nothing yeah. else, and the patience um, side of things, it's it's quite nice. So I, I bought myself a hide um, last week. So I've got that set up at the bottom of the garden and it's lovely just to spend a couple of hours just yourself with your own yeah. thoughts, you know, 
waiting to see if a bird does happen to come to the feeder or the little prop that you've set up. Um, yeah. So, I, yeah, I'm enjoying that side. So I might continue doing that, you know, once we get out again. Yeah, I was just say a lot of people have had to adapt and, and yeah. just find ways of being kind of creative still within this this kind of past 12 months and I think some people have suffered as well from you know what I've read and, and, and pictures I've seen and stories that I've read that people just can't get motivated enough to to get yeah. out and, and do something or find other ways of kind of still kind of playing around with the camera because you, you said at the start obviously photography is a progression thing for you know that you, you've grown up and you've tried different things that you know over the past 12 months given how restrictive it's been especially for a landscape photographer primarily mm -hmm. uh, you know do you think you've still improved you know on your work say from like you know early parts of 2020 up until now and you know are there still improvements that you're trying to to make in your work is there still things that you struggle with necessarily i would say photoshop is my nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I feel okay and comfortable enough with the camera. I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't know everything. I don't know all the settings or anything, but what I need to know, I think I'm comfortable with. Um, but in terms of the post-processing, I still struggle a little bit with that. Um, I would like to get better at processing my landscape images. Mm. Um, so I'm thinking of sort of luminosity masks and um, exposure blending, that type of thing. I haven't really done. Um, I've watched many YouTube videos over, you know, on it, um, but I've never had the opportunity to actually use it. So yeah. I think once I do get out of lockdown and I get some more images, I certainly want to give that a, a try. What, what are you using at the minute? What do you edit on currently? Lightroom yeah. predominantly, and then just importing into Photoshop for very minor things, you know, like cloning outs or um, that kind of thing. Nothing more complicated than that. No, I mean, I, I see these wonderful images in the gallery, you know, with the very creative <laughs> things. And I just look at them thinking, how on earth do people do this? Oh, I find it so I difficult. Was... Hours can be lost in, in editing. Like, like you say, you know, you can you can sit and wait for a, for a bird for hours. You know, I think there's there's elements of photography, whether it's editing or taking the picture, that, that just requires a large amount of patience and time. And, yeah. and that doesn't, it doesn't always fit with everybody's lifestyle. You haven't necessarily got, you know, three, four hours to sit and do these amazing edits, as they say, you sometimes see. But obviously, yeah. you know, given the, the kind of the awards that you've won, you know, and the stature that you have of your photography um, within the Eye Photography Gallery, I think whatever you're doing in the minute is, is absolutely phenomenal. It really, really is. It's, it's, it's outstanding. So, you know, if you're still looking to make more improvements, um, you're probably going to end up with more awards, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> That would be nice. <laughs> and then, you, then your husband will be super jealous. <laughs> you know, if you're a competitive couple, then yeah, you're really going to keep, he's going to be keeping up with you most definitely. Know, there'll be a divorce on the cards before we know it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, in terms in terms of, you know, I suppose, again, looking back over the past 12 months and then also looking forward, you know, as a landscape photographer, I, I appreciate you've had to kind of, you know, you've changed your your habits a little bit within wildlife. But is there is there something that you kind of have as like a motivator to kind of always keep you going and keep them going out? Because, I, again, I appreciate, you know, wherever you are in the world, you get bad weather from time to time and cold seasons. So it's not always easy to kind of force yourself to go out there if it's looking pretty miserable but do you do you have some sort of kind of process you know you try to kind of set yourself up with or a mindset to think you know regardless of the weather I'm gonna get outside or do you have also days where you just sit back and go nah maybe I'll leave it till tomorrow <laughs> to be honest with with working five days a week I don't really need much motivation to try and get out at the weekend and take <laughs> photos because I'm absolutely desperate to get out with the camera so at the moment obviously things are a little bit more difficult yeah. Um, but I would always check, um, you know, an app on the phone just to see what the chances of decent weather in a particular location would be. You know, am I likely to get a sunrise, possibly get a sunset? Um, so I try and do my research around a particular area beforehand. Um, but I must admit, if it's raining, um, which living in the west coast of Scotland tends to happen about 95% of the time at the weekend. It can be great during the week. As soon as the weekend comes, you get two solid days of rain. Um, so I don't generally go out when it's raining because I, I don't think there's much fun sitting at a beach in the pouring rain <laughs> waiting to, to you know, photograph waves or something like that. That really doesn't motivate me in the slightest. But 
generally speaking, I'm, I like to get up early in the morning, try and get out for sunrise if I can, yeah. simply because there's very few people around. I, I find that if you go out for sunset, more people tend to hang around for sunset. Yeah. So they're in the location that you want to be in um, and you're either going to try and have to clone them out or move you know, your, your composition or whatever. So generally, I like to get out early in the morning and then you're back home for breakfast and then the, the days to yourself wow so yeah you really are up kind of quite early and get I mean yeah do you prefer not to have kind of people within your scenes do you prefer it just to be kind of a, a more natural view you know quite an untouched yeah. look really yeah I like it to look as if I'm the only person there and um, it really annoys me when I, I rock up to somewhere and there's five other photographers say, <laughs> standing with their <laughs> tripods out that really bothers me. Um, so I tried to get places really early. So I could be there a couple of hours before sunrise um, just so that I've managed to scope out the location that I want. And I'm quite happy to sit there and wait for it. Oh my God, um, that, that is dedication and patience. But I, that is, you know, one of the, well, not just the key elements to a good landscape photographer, but obviously that kind of uh, goes across into wildlife. But again, ultimately, it's just ultimate passion for for the art and pursuit of getting the image that you want isn't it really Uh, yeah I mean the 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 one thing I quite like to ask on a lot of interviews that I've done previously it's like what I call the time time machine question or time travel question that you know given where you are now if you could kind of go back in time and to your younger self to your you know when you're starting out kind of are there any valuable lessons that you've learned as a photographer that you would kind of tell your younger self something you know like one little golden nugget of information that you think may have helped your life as a photographer that a little bit easier yeah I think trying not to be disappointed that you don't get the shot that you're going out for um I still struggle with that now actually because if I have a location in mind I do tend to read up on it or I go on Flickr or Pinterest or some Instagram or something and have a look at all these wonderful images of a particular place so I tend to have that in my head as to what I'm trying to achieve and then nine times out of ten you'll turn up at the location and it's raining or it's overcast (laughs) and it's just not you're not going to get what you you know, you, you thought you were going to get. And I think try not to be too disheartened by that yeah. and not disappointed if you don't come away with that banger of an image that you thought you were going to get. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, just trying to make the most of what you have at that particular time, I yeah. think it's important. Yeah, I, I, I can fully agree with that. There's, there's times even now that even you know doing photography for as long as I have I'll go out there not get any pictures that I'm that bothered about that enamored about and think "Hmm." Mm. but I don't come away disheartened because I think you know at least I got out I got to go and do something enjoyed the trip you know enjoyed the location wherever I was going or at least I've tried the new technique okay it hasn't worked and you know maybe I'll come back and revisit it but it's I think it's that first hurdle uh, of getting over it if it if it doesn't work out then you can try it again Mm. because yeah, so few times in photography do you get the image that you want when you want it because you're relying on the rest of the world or a, a bird or a person or you know timing for it to all fall into place and life unfortunately isn't like that no it's not <laughs> it's, so you know you are literally having to dance to someone else's tune really but um my, my last question is it's kind of you just touched on very very briefly there because I always obviously believe creative people need inspiration in one form or another and obviously you know the past 12 months has been very very hard I imagine for anybody to kind of keep that creative mindset but you know looking kind of past you know before 2020 and obviously into the future as a landscape photographer where do you find inspiration do you just go traveling a lot or do you kind of look online a lot for images beforehand how how do you kind of set yourself up for your next kind of photo shoot well I tend to I've, well, I've actually got a few books here, which you'll probably not see if you're just listening to the. <laughs> you have to, <laughs> to watch the, the, uh, the YouTube version yes. of this. <laughs> so I've got these um, photography books. I don't know if you can see uh, a yeah. photo view that they there's particularly the one of Scotland, which obviously I use more often than not. But they, they do a whole series of um, sort of North Wales, which is where I took the um, the one that was in the last critique that you did, yes. the, the lighthouse the one. Lighthouse, yeah. Um, and I spend quite a bit of time in Cornwall so they do these all of different locations I think it might just be UK specific but it gives you an idea of 
um, photography locations in a particular area. Yeah. So what I tend to do if there's a particular area that I quite fancy visiting, I'll get one of these books, try and mark out a few locations and then maybe book a couple of days away in somewhere close by and see if I can tick off as many of the, yeah. the locations as I can. Um, so I do do quite a lot of looking and dreaming of being able to go to these places. <laughs> um, so, you know, once restrictions are lifted, I'm out there again. <laughs> Can't so, wait. Uh, yeah. So, and uh, YouTube as well. I follow quite a lot of um, photographers on YouTube and subscribe to their channels. And yeah. we sort of live vicariously through them. You know, you can see them going to different locations as well. And you maybe think, oh, that might be somewhere to try in the future. Yeah. Um, yeah yeah you're right I think there is a lot of um it's almost kind of like scouting your location beforehand if you can see someone that's been there I news um you said Pinterest and I news also Instagram quite a bit um that you can kind of geotag images and then from there you can have a look at all the corresponding images that people have taken from a particular place and it just gives you a better idea of the uh the environment but all then also you know all the hazards that people have kind of maybe experienced before so you almost have an idea you know where the right angle is where the wrong ones are and you know and what to watch out for and also what everybody else is shooting and therefore if you're looking to try and make your images different what else you can do to to make them stand out yep. really so it, it's fantastic you plan so well you know it, it, it doesn't take that long either does it it doesn't take you know hours of no, no. arranging no. things does it it's just no. a couple of minutes yeah I'm, I'm obviously great fun to go on holiday with because i've got every location planned for every single day we're getting up at two o'clock in the morning to be at such and such a place for sun, sunrise so no chance for an actual relaxing holiday this is very Never. much a kind of a sightseeing trip with a camera yes, with exactly <laughs> And so just to wrap up, Deborah, um, I, I was obviously, you know, people are listening to this, you know, with, with being photography, we're always very uh, visually stimulated as creative people. So I'm sure people would love to kind of check out a little bit more of your photography, because especially on the, the YouTube version of this podcast, we'll try and kind of put some of the images up as we've been talking. But um, have you got a website or some uh, social media um, kind of yeah, handles um, that we can... Um, I'm pretty much everywhere. Um, I've got a website, which is just debramcphail.co.uk, which is imaginatively titled. Um, I'm on Instagram as well as through Deb's Lens. Um, so I think probably they're the, the main two areas where I, I tend to upload most of my images. Fantastic. We'll make sure we kind of put them somewhere with all our posts so everybody can go and check out your images. Um, but I just wanted to say it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you, Tebra. It's too. been really, really nice having you on to be able to give us a bit of an experience as to, you know, I should say, what life has been like under lockdown as a, a landscape photographer, but then also, you know, the, the bright sunshine and future that we've got to look forward to, you know, kind of coming absolutely. ahead as well, really. But um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, thank you for inviting me.